So, today I'm going to be talking about death by regulation, how the 1962 amendments to the Kefauver Harris, uh, the, yeah, sorry, the 1960 Kefauver Harris amendments to the Food and Drug Act have taken about five to ten years off each of our lives. And that's very sad, but the good news is that things are about to change. Um, what I'm talking to you about today, uh, let's see, how do I do the next slide? I just ask? Is this the button? Is this what you need? Oh, oh there we go. Okay. Um, uh, hold on. Or I can just say the next slide. No, I'll, I'll go. Go. Okay. Well, I'll just, I'll, while we're finding the clicker, I'll just tell you that what I'm talking about is my, is, is all in, is a part of what's in my new book, Death by Regulation. And I click the Amazon bestseller list on April 10th. And you'll, yes, there you go. So it, it actually hit it not only in the US, but in Canada and Germany, which was a real surprise to me. I don't, I guess I had some fans there that, that wanted it, <laughs> which I was excited about. So if we go to the third slide, the 1962 Keep Off the Harris Amendments. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what they did to create this big problem about losing our lives. And that's why the subtitle of the book is How We Were Robbed of the Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It. Because obviously we want to reclaim it. These amendments basically gave the FDA almost unlimited power over the pharmaceutical drug development. And I was in the industry when these regulations were taking effect. They really didn't start hitting hard until the 1970s. And I was in the industry in 75 to 95. And what, what they did is they allowed the FDA to dictate which animal studies had to precede human trials, what the human trials had to look like, and especially it needed human trials that showed effectiveness. Because before the 62 amendments, safety was the biggest consideration in drug approval. It also influenced the advertising and labeling. The FDA had control of that. Uh, that's why you see on television commercials all those side effects. Those are all the things that the FDA insists on putting in pharmaceutical ads. It oversees the manufacturing of the drugs. And it, it made the FDA examiners actually sign off and put their head in the proverbial hanging suits when they approved a new drug. Prior to these amendments, the pharmaceutical companies would send all of their data to the FDA. It's a whole truckload of now, actually. Um, so they'd send their data to the FDA, the FDA would look it over, and if they didn't object, in six months, you could market your drug. After the amendments, that all changed. Some examiner had to sign on the dotted line, this is okay to approve. And so now the Congress had a scapegoat. If anything got approved, it had side effects. And since all drugs have side effects, occasionally a drug would have side effects that came to the attention of the American public, and the FDA would basically get battered in their, um, battered by Congress. And of course, naturally the FDA didn't like this, so it started getting more and more studies to what the pharmaceutical companies needed to do. Now, these laws were passed in 62, but because of this open-ended power, the regulations actually increase every year. This is very important to understand. They're metastasizing throughout not just the pharmaceutical industry, which has been totally reshaped by these amendments, but it's redefining what medical practice is. I won't be able to get into it in this talk but you can ask me questions if you want to later or in the book. And it shifted our medical paradigm from prevention to treatment. I think this was the worst part of the amendments. It's very hard to put a number on how many people died from the shift in the medical paradigm from prevention to treatment. But, but again, I, I have some estimates in the book. But what I'm going to talk about today, because I have hard numbers for this, is how it reshaped the pharmaceutical industry and what that did to take five to ten years off each of our lives. In this slide, you can see what the amendments did from the time it takes a drug to get from the lab bench to the marketplace. And as you can see, 
uh, prior to the amendments, uh, what we saw was we saw that drug development time took about four years. But after the amendments were passed here in 1962, it steadily climbed until it got to about 14 years in the last century. And then a little band-aid of legislation was put on these amendments because everyone went, wow, 14 years, that's too much. Ah, but I know what we can do. We can, we can ask the pharmaceutical companies to pay a user fee for the FDA. It started out at 100,000, it's now about 2 million. And um, so now the FDA is uh, part of the FDA that is examining all of this data from the pharmaceutical companies. About half of their salaries are paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. So you can imagine that changes their incentives a little bit. Well, we did manage to shorten the time. Look, it went from 14 years to about 13. <laughs> but of course, a lot of people died waiting. And you know, when, when we were working on AIDS drugs, uh, during the 90s and the late 80s. The AIDS patients knew they couldn't wait for new drugs to be developed. They would be dead by then. So what they did is they hired black market chemists to make the same drugs we were working on the drug companies. And by the time the FDA gave us permission to put the drugs in people, everyone in the country who was an AIDS sufferer and wanted our drugs had already had them and were resistant. So we actually had to uh, wait until new people were diagnosed with AIDS to do the tests that the FDA wanted. Now, when a drug is life-saving and you wait an extra 10 years in order to have it come to market, you might imagine that people would die. They'd die waiting. And you'd be right. Uh, you don't need to look at all the numbers. This is for the technically inclined. But, you know, since we know, for example, uh, and I talk about NCDs, <coughs> new chemical entities, these are totally new drugs. We know how, how many of these new drugs were approved in different decades. We know what, what their mean development time was uh, doing from the slide that we just saw. And we know, of course, what it would have been without the amendments. So we can actually calculate the lives lost due to the amendments. It comes out to 15 million people. Uh, to give you a feel for that, that's 10 times more people than have died in all the wars since our country was founded. This is huge. And I am just beginning, which is the saddest part of all. So now you might imagine, though, that with this increase in development time, that the cost of drugs would go up. And you would be right. Here's what happened uh, <coughs> over the years. In the early days before the amendments, we were getting the R&D costs for a new drug to gradually increase. But now, after the amendments, it doesn't increase linearly, it increases exponentially. In other words, a lot. And it's going up every year, even though the development time is staying the same. Why is that? Well, it turns out that drug companies know that the faster they get the drug to market, the more money they'll make and the longer they'll have patent protection. So what they do is they find ways to compress the time frame and keep it to this 13, 14 year period. But they do that by being very wasteful about how they do development. If they don't know which uh, dose they need to give the rats so that the FDA will realize that yes, this is a good dose, they do many doses instead. This increases the cost and keeps the timeline low. And you might imagine that these huge costs uh, make a difference in what you pay at the pharmacy. And of course, you'd be right. Mm -hmm. If you look at the average cost of a new prescription drug and plot it against what we call capitalized R&D, in other words, the research and development costs that include the time cost of money, right? Because there's the time cost of money. Uh, what you get is a direct correlation for the technically inclined, this is an R squared value of 0.94. It's about as good as you get. And so you can see that it's not pharmaceutical greed, uh, pharmaceutical company greed that is driving drug prices. It is the cost of regulation. It's a direct correlation. So if you were to do a calculation to see what the difference would be between pre and post amendment 
drug costs, you would see that if we could have maintained the pre-amendment cost of research and development for new drugs, we would be paying about 5 to 10% of what we're now paying in the pharmacy. That is a huge difference. But again, as I, as I told you earlier, I'm just beginning. Not only do we pay to have drugs delayed 10 years of getting from the bench to the marketplace, we are also experiencing an incredible loss of innovation. And this is very important because I don't care how rich you are, if the drug hasn't been invented, you can't buy it. And so, you know, people used, very wealthy people used to die from infections before we had antibiotics. And now, if somebody had an infection of the nature or appendicitis or burst or something like that, you know, they would have a chance of survival today, whereas they didn't back before antibiotics were invented. So it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, you cannot buy something that hasn't been invented. And we'll revisit this thought a little later in my talk. So studies show that about 50% of the drugs that are developed drop out in what we call late phase development. In other words, when the manufacturers spend about 80% of what they need to spend to get it to market, they go, wait a minute, we're not going to make any money on this drug. In fact, we're going to keep losing money. Better that we stop now and don't put it in the marketplace than continue to throw dollars at it and lose. So about 50% of the drugs go um, just never make it to the market because of that. But there are a lot of drugs that never even start development because the manufacturer realizes they can't recover their costs. Only about two to three drugs out of ten actually do that. The industry is relying on blockbuster drugs in order to pay for all the failures and for the drugs that don't make up their development costs. So let me give you an example from my own research. I got a call from the FDA one day and they said, well, hey, we understand, Dr. Ruard, that you have applied for a pack for prostaglandins and liver disease. And we're very excited about this because there isn't any cure for liver disease of this type. 100,000 people die every year, and we want to help you get it to market. Well, being young and naive, I thought that would make a difference. But when we figured out, and let me go back for a minute. For those who don't know what prostaglandins are, if you're taking fish oil, you're taking it in order to make what we call the good prostaglandins, or eicosanoids, as they're, uh, they're labeled today. And so what we were trying to do is balance, properly balance the eicosanoids in the body. And we had had some good animal data that showed that we might be able to do that. But the problem is when you have a brand new drug, really different than anything else on the market, you don't know what dose to give. You don't know how many times you have to give. Uh, you don't even sometimes know what you can measure. I mean, did we have to cut a piece of liver out of a person every time we wanted to look at it? You don't know how long to give it. Because liver disease takes a long time, years, to develop. And if we, if we didn't treat long enough, or if we guessed wrong on any of these other parameters, the human studies, which takes years to complete, might not have the statistical significance that the FDA demands. And if we didn't get that, we would have to start all over again. So we have to start years of studies again, and by the time we got our drug to market, it would go generic the first day and we wouldn't make any money. At least not enough to recover these huge development costs. And so the company decided not to go ahead and put this drug on the market. Now, if you just estimate that 50% of our innovation, I'm sorry, 50% of our innovation is lost, and you assume that the drugs are only, the lost drugs are only about 25 aspirin as effective as the ones that we currently have on the market, uh, that means we've lost about 26.7 million people. And that's a pretty conservative estimate, as you might guess. If you total those two numbers together, the numbers that die waiting and the numbers that we lost of innovation, and add a, a few, a 1.7 million people who didn't learn about aspirin because the FDA forbade manufacturers to talk about it for almost 20 years, uh, you get that about half the people who have died since 1962 have lost their lives 
because of the amendments and had lost an average of 11 years. Or another way of looking at it is we've all lost about 5.5 years. So when I say that we have lost five to 10 years of our lives, I'm extrapolating a little bit for those things that I can't calculate because I think they're even bigger than what I'm talking about today. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. I want to point out something. A lot of people believe that the FDA regulations protect them and keep them safe. But if you look at the 1962 amendments, uh, what you see is that we really didn't get a big safety benefit from it. In fact, we got no benefit at all. Before the amendments, about 2.5% of drugs that made it to the market were taken off the market later by the FDA when they were found to have bad side effects. After the amendments, 3.3 were taken off the market. In other words, more were taken off the market, although I don't think these numbers actually are very different. So what that means is we got no safety benefits. You couldn't argue from the withdrawal rate that we improved the drugs we actually put on the market. And in fact, the biggest drug disaster of all happened after the amendments. The biggest one before the amendments didn't even happen in the United States. That was thalidomide. And it caused about 10,000 deformities in Europe where it was marketed. It was not marketed in the United States, but it was being tested. So there were, I think, a half a dozen children that were born missing limbs, because that's what the mind does to, um, to babies that are, whose mothers are given to the mind in the first one or two months of pregnancy. Now, what the FDA did do after the amendments were passed is it approved vials, which was probably the biggest drug disaster in history. By the FDA's own estimation, there were 60,000 deaths from Vioxx and 140,000 heart attacks. And some of the FDA examiners were very upset about the Vioxx approval. They said it shouldn't be approved because there was data indicating that this might be a problem. Uh, David Graham, one of the FDA people who is most vocal about this, was told by his supervisor that Vioxx would be approved because the drug companies were the FDA's client. And if you think back to what I told you about the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, where the drug companies could pay this user fee to the FDA, and now half the FDA regulators have their salaries paid by the drug companies, you can see why that is. Of course, before the amendments, Congress, which funded the FDA, was the FDA's client. The American people never have been. So, given all this, it's not surprising that we've had problems. In fact, some people think today's drugs are much more dangerous than the ones pre amendment because properly prescribed drugs are now the fifth law and even cause of death in the U.S. I'm not sure that today's drugs are actually more dangerous, but several things that happened during the 1962 amendments and after they passed, I think are more responsible than what are these. Well, first of all, today's drugs do require patents if there's any hope of the drug company recovering their costs. Now, when I joined up John in the mid-1970s, we were still developing drugs without patents. But a couple years after I was there and the amendments were really kicking in, Management told us we can no longer develop drugs or even propose developing drugs that didn't have patents. So if a drug has to have a patent, usually what that means is that the, the drug isn't something your body normally sees, which makes it more difficult for the body to detoxify. And then because it costs so much now to get a drug on the market, manufacturers can't recover their costs if you take it for a week or two, like you might with antibiotics. So they go for these, what I call, lifestyle drugs, drugs that you're going to take for decades. Now, that's also a problem, because your body can handle something for a few weeks. But a few decades, well, that makes it more difficult, doesn't it? So that's why, uh, another reason why we have drugs that act dangerously, and also 
the doctors are encouraged to prescribe multiple drugs. Because if you start taking them for decades, you might have a side effect, so they prescribe another drug to counter that side effect. <laughs> you know, then they're taking, some people are taking as, as much as two, even three dozen drugs a day. And so now these drugs also interact. And it makes it so difficult for the body. It can't handle all that detoxification. So of course there's some problems. Of course we're going to have drugs as a major cause of death when they are handled in this way. And again, all of this is due to the amendments. So this is another way in which the amendments have really caused problems for us. And the reason they don't help us with safety is because most safety issues before the amendments were because we were, we were just not knowledgeable. <laughs> Let's take thalidomide, for instance. Back in the 1950s and early 60s, we really didn't appreciate that the fetus was much more sensitive to drugs than the mother was. And so when thalidomide, which was actually a safer sleeping drug for adults, was also found to help pregnant women alleviate um, you know, their, their nausea and, and things that, the morning sickness that came with pregnancy, <coughs> they started taking these drugs and didn't realize it was a problem. Of course, now we anticipate this and we test to make sure, as much as we can with animal studies, that drugs aren't going to have an effect. Back then, we didn't know any better. So safety problems today are also falling in the category. And so that's one of the problems and the challenges of putting drugs to market. There really is no such thing as a safe drug. Every drug has a patient population that it will harm. And that's because drugs are powerful. If, they, if you want them to cure you, you know, that, that power, which is so great, Unfortunately, it hurts some people just as antibiotics, while they can save a life if you're dying from infection, can also kill you if you have an allergic reaction. So no drug is totally safe, and no drug is totally effective. So the amendments which require drugs to be both safe and effective, really we're telling the FDA don't prove anything at all, because there's no such thing as a safe and effective drug for everyone. Uh, luckily, the FDA at least does still approve drugs. So, basically, what I'm telling you is we didn't really get any benefits from these amendments, but we got a lot of problems that cost us years of our lives. Now, the biggest thing I think that happened is the switch from prevention to treatment. And I'll just give you a few examples. So, you know, I was working in the industry back before the time when we had, we had the ability to genetically manipulate animals. And our rats were notoriously healthy. How could we test new drugs and disease models if we couldn't make our rats sick? So these rats had had their diet tested very carefully, so they had all the nutrients and things that they needed. And that's why they were so hardy. So what we did is we started taking away their vitamins. Or we started overwhelming their bodies with excessive amounts of fat or sugar. And they got sick. And we went, aha! We want to stay healthy, we've got to be careful what we eat. And so you watched all the researchers in the company being careful of their diet, staying slender, getting exercise, not smoking, doing all these things to manipulate the body biochemistry optimally. <laughs> because they learned from the rats, right? Uh, the MDs who didn't have this exposure oftentimes, and there were a few exceptions, but almost Almost always I felt you could kind of tell who's the MD and who's the PhD researcher because the MDs were overweight, they smoked, they drank, they did all the things that weren't so good for their bodies and they certainly didn't take vitamins and minerals like the researchers were doing. So it, it, it's kind of interesting. But anyhow, the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is that these amendments really made it tough to for, for manufacturers of vitamins and minerals to tell people about the great effects of their nutrients. And let me give you an example. So I was on an airplane, and the company where I was working for, Upjohn, was developing something we called Lazaroids, because we named them after Lazaroids, because like these drugs seem to do everything, right? <laughs> and someone that I, I was on the plane with and heard about these Lazaroids and said, can you get me some? And I said, I'll check. So I talked to the project manager and he said, no, we can't give them at this point in the development 
one, and they aren't yet FDA approved, but just tell this guy to take lots of vitamin E because it will do the same thing. <laughs> so, why <are> we, <laughs> so why are we spending uh, the, 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 the number today is about two and a half billion dollars to get a drug to market? Why are we spending all this money to get a drug to market if vitamin E will do the same thing? The reason for doing it is that if a vitamin E manufacturer made a health claim for that vitamin, the FDA would shut them down if they didn't go through this 14 years we talked about earlier. And we'd always be trying to spend this two and a half million dollars and have a generic product on its hands, you know, once they hit the market. Well, nobody's going to do that because they can't recover the cost. So basically, we stopped learning about health claims and things that vitamins and nutrients could do for us. And that's really sad. Uh, the FDA actually tried to jail a couple of libertarians who started the Life Extension Foundation, which does research in life extension and sells vitamins. And the reason they tried to shut them down is they introduced to the U.S. market a nutrient called coenzyme Q. And at the time they did that, of course, they were getting, they were, they had seen the Japanese studies. That Japanese had it on the market as a prescription drug. And the FDA felt because Japan had it as a prescription drug, we should too, even though it's a natural substance. And so they tried to jail these libertarians that started the Life Extension Foundation, but they fought back for years. It took, I think, about six or seven years to win the case, and they finally did. And the good news about that is had they lost, not only would it have been bad for them, but CoQ has been shown to be the nutrient that you take along with your statins if you don't want to have all the side effects of statins. So, you know, the, some of the side effects of drugs can actually be helped by nutrients, but the people who develop these nutrients really can't advertise that effect. It has to be coming from a third party. Otherwise, uh, the people risk prosecution. Now, also, we talked about the voter body. These amendments, which were put in place because Americans at the time were very afraid of the minimide, maybe US, or something like the minimide coming to the U.S., and yet they created what I call the American flu. What was that? Well, in the early 80s, we knew that folic acid, a B vitamin, could prevent almost in, in 100% the neural tube defects or birth defects that some children have. These are very serious birth defects. Uh, children are usually institutionalized for that. And yet the FDA would not allow folic acid manufacturers to advertise this. And the, the women needed to take folic acid in the first month or two of pregnancy to prevent this. So what they wanted to recommend is that all women of childbearing potential take folic acid. Well, the FDA wouldn't let them talk about that without <coughs> prosecution. And so, it was not until the Center for Disease Control, another government agency, started about 12 years later to talk about this themselves and recommend that all women of childbearing potential take folic acid. But even then, the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers that they talked about this effect, that they'd shut them down. And so, in a big reversal a few years later, the FDA demanded that grain manufacturers who made cereals and breads supplement their products with folic acid. <laughs> now, what this tells you is the <coughs> FDA knew very well that folic acid would help prevent these birth defects. But instead of allowing folic acid manufacturers to educate everyone in this important nutritional uh, product, what they did is they delayed it for about 12 years. And then by, by asking all these other manufacturers of grain products to supplement, they felt the problem was solved. But you know, people don't get the right dose. It depends how much grain you eat, right? So that wasn't actually very effective, as studies show. Now, in some other countries where folic acid manufacturers were allowed to advertise, um, women of childbearing potential went from about 5% taking folic acid to about 80% in just a matter of a couple of years. In the meantime, in the U.S., we had about 10,000 babies born needlessly with these birth defects. And many more were aborted because you can test for this in utero. 
Now, another thing that's come about is because it's very difficult to get natural products and a health claim, manufacturers, when they see a really a really good natural product, they're starting to tweak it to get patents, and that's what happened with fish oil. Manufacturers put an extra chemical group on the fish oil. And when they did that, they were able to get a patent on it. Now this extra group comes off, your body takes it off, so then you can have a prescription fish oil. Uh, my sister is eligible for a prescription fish oil, so she found out that her copay, just her copay for the prescription fish oil, was about the same amount that she was paying for high quality fish oil. So in other words, our insurance companies are paying about 80% of the bill, we're paying 20%, maybe even less, depending on your insurance plan. And, and so it's increasing the cost of medicine, obviously. And, get this, the prescription fish oil isn't even the purest fish oil on the market. Um, Mary Sears, who developed the Zonda oil, actually was also one of the earliest people to recommend taking fish oil because he did not want the people he was recommending this to to have problems. He made sure his fish oil was very pure. It has uh, less PCBs, which is a pesticide contaminant in it, than the prescription fish oil. But it's against the law for him to go to doctors and say to doctors, hey, our, prescription, our, our fish oil is better than the prescription fish oil that has less PCBs. Because he hasn't gone through 14 years of all these regulatory box checking things. Also, uh, I, I said I wouldn't talk a whole lot about change in medical practice, but I do want to share this one thing because I think it's so important. You know, stem cell research is really starting to take off. Um, there's a doctor in Colorado who really is the top person in this field, in my opinion, in orthopedic stem cells. And he was taking athletes and other people who had um, ACL tears, um, other problems that would require massive surgery, and using stem cells to allow them to get well faster. Now, these are your own stem cells. Uh, I, I know all of you aren't familiar with this, so let me just tell you what happens is, um, you know, some of the, the um, stem cells are taken out of your bone marrow and then injected back into the knee or wherever you need it. And what they do, the stem cells do, is they are, they, they are kind of basic cells and when you put them into a particular tissue, they understand somehow that they're supposed to act like that tissue. So if you put them in the knee, they understand, okay, we're supposed to make, um, we're, we're injected near the anterior cruciate ligament or ACL. We need to make, we need to mend this ACL. Uh, and he was starting to take the stem cells out. Instead of injecting them on the same day, he was growing them in the laboratory so that now he was injecting not the few stem cells that you can get, but a lot of stem cells. And especially diabetic patients really benefited from having these larger stem cell pods. Well, the FDA said, hey, if you take the stem cells out and inject them back the same day, we're going to say, yeah, that's okay, that's medical practice. But if you grow them in the test tube and then put them back in person, that's a drug. It needs about 14 years of testing. And this was taken to court. The doctor in Colorado just couldn't believe it. So he took them to court, the FDA to court, and lost. And so now he has... Uh, he has facilities in Colorado. In fact, he's franchised it out, so you can, you probably have a center close to you. And, of course, if you need the stem cells that grow for a week, you have to go to the Bahamas. Or Panama. Pardon me? Panama, too. Panama, too. Okay, I didn't realize he'd start in Panama. Okay. So, this is how the FDA has manipulated um, and really changed medical practice and its definition. I just want to give you one more example uh, in prevention. So vitamin D is very important. It's actually kind of a hormone for your body. It acts more like a hormone than our standard vitamins. And according to estimates from some researchers, they believe that up, um, doubling our vitamin D levels would probably add two years to our lives. But of course, if he were a manufacturer, he couldn't even talk about that. And manufacturers can't tell you that. I can't tell you all the wonderful things that vitamin D does. In death by regulation, I go to some, uh, I go to some trouble to educate people on what vitamin D can do so that they will know. But I'm not selling vitamin D, so I can do that. <laughs>
Anyway, I think this gives you an idea of why I say that the impact of the amendments on prevention are probably greater than anything that I talked about in the pharmaceutical industry per se. I mean, prevention is the face of Ben Franklin was right. The amounts of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, I recommend. <laughs> Oh, oh, this is my conclusion, I'm sorry, I'm not quite there. The side effects of regulation can be just as deadly as side effects from drugs. And the nice thing about this, uh, nice, I mean obviously it's not nice, but from a libertarian standpoint, in terms of trying to change things, what's good about these regulations is they affect us all as human beings. It doesn't matter for regulators, drug company executives, Patients, doctors, research scientists, wherever we are, we're affected by this. Congressional representatives are affected. So Congress is also affected. Everybody's affected. So that's why I think if the word got out about this, uh, there might be some action taken, even by the people who want to stop such action and deregulation. Um, there is, uh, and maybe many of you have heard of this, there is something called the right to try out there that's now in Congress. Now, I told you the story about the AIDS patients. Well, cancer patients didn't want to do what the AIDS patients didn't go to the black market. So they actually sued the FDA and said they had the constitutional right to try to save their lives any way they could. And the courts ruled, no, you don't have the right to save your life if you have to take an unapproved drug to do it. So, right to try is basically the same thing that can cancer patients were trying to get. It says terminally ill patients can negotiate directly with the drug company to get a drug that is not yet approved by the FDA. However, there are some problems. You still are going to have to approve that drug. The FDA is still going to have to approve that drug for marketing. So, it still really controls that drug. And it can punish the drug companies who use right to try simply dragging their feet on the approval. So companies are going to be hesitant to do that. And since the courts have ruled that the FDA can't be sued for denying approval, uh, the pharmaceutical companies you know, have, have no way to reverse that. Um, and, and a lot of people were all excited about the new FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, because he was he said to be a libertarian. But actually, even if he were, and he's not, if he were standing over his examiners, he's only going to be there at most seven years. The record's about seven years. Some, some commissioners are only there for one or two years. So the, what can be done is going to be limited. Um, and Right to Try has passed in 38 states. It started out as something that was passing state by state. But even in states where it's passed, it's had minimal impact because companies are afraid to get involved with this for fear the FDA is going to come back after them. Now, the Heartland Institute is going to be promoting free to choose medicine. It's kind of waiting until right to try uh, either passes or, or fails to pass in Congress. Free to choose medicine does not have a security once, once a drug is in the free to choose medicine track, it stays there and never needs FDA approval. So even though it needs to get to what we call phase two, under the FDA process, which means it has to go through some safety testing and one small study to show effectiveness. Um, that is minor compared to what follows. It's probably about a six-year process or seven-year process as opposed to 14 years. So that could shorten things. So my recommendations are to, of course, repeal the amendments. Unfortunately, that's not enough because there's been so many court cases that essentially the, the the impact of the amendments has been codified into our, into our legal system already. So if you're going to have to make FDA approval unnecessary for marketing if you really want to roll back the impact that the amendments have had. And I say, okay, yes, of course I'd like to get in the FDA. But uh, in my book, I only make the argument that the FDA, for the FDA's problems with drugs. So I say, make it a certified. It can recommend whatever it wants, <laughs> and people can use it or not. And the nice thing about that is what will happen is there will be private certifying agencies, and there might be some third party testing, because the FDA doesn't do any testing at all. It tells the manufacturers which tests to do, 
The manufacturers, it's a truckload of data, although today we do it electronically. Uh, back in the day when I was there, we filled up a truck with all this paper and sent it to the FDA. The FDA took years to look at it. Well, if you make, if you make FDA certified agencies, others will spring up and they will probably do third party testing, which is a really good thing. And many of you know that we actually certify our electrical appliances today. They are not regulated, they're certified. You can buy an electrical appliance without the UL symbol like that. But what UL does is it works with the manufacturers to get a safe product on the market and puts a seal of approval, and that way you know it's been certified. But you can still purchase something without that English. And of course, one of the things I like about my plan is free to choose medicine more conservative. So it's possible that it will help free to choose medicine pass, which I think would be probably <coughs> such a strong step in the right direction that I think it will eventually make the FDA obsolete. I'm going to wrap up now and just uh, let you know that my books are available here. Of course, including death by regulation, which we've been talking about. Um, my website is Yurt.com. I invite you to go there and sign up for my newsletter so you can be on top of things that are happening in this arena. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-publisher, Liberty International, uh, of which I am chair. And I hope you will visit our website. For those of you who are longtime libertarians, Liberty International used to be International Society for Individual Liberty with the unfortunate acronym of ISIL. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got hacked <laughs> so many times and had our website destroyed that we decided that better change our name. So we did. And I, I hope you'll join us for our conference in Krakow if you can, August 12th and 15th. Even if you can't do that, I really hope you'll sign in for our newsletter as well. And we will inform you about what's going on in the field, some of the things that might not make it into um, our current CNN, CNN, and other types of control media. <laughs> so I'd like to come there and take whatever questions you have. Thank you.